Now moving to item three, public participation. Um, and we have a number of um, public forum participations and um, one deputation as well. So I would first of all call Joe Mackay of the Cycling Action Network, who's going to speak to us regarding the New Zealand Bike Expo. So, Joe, good morning. Welcome to the table. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And you have um, five minutes um, for this public participation. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Turner. Can you touch the mic? No, so it goes green. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Turner. And councillors, thanks for allowing me to ha um, have five minutes today. I'm a volunteer at Cycling Na Action Network, CAN, which is a national advocacy organisation. And with me today, I've got David Hawke um, and Robert Fleming from Spokes Canterbury, who I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, Spokes Canterbury is CAN's uh, local group here in Christchurch. And I think you've been working with, with these guys and with Don Babe and with Clean Curry and Claire Simpson over the years as well. So um, I'm involved in organising the first New Zealand Bike Expo in Christchurch, which we're really excited about being here. Um, I live in Wellington, so just to let you know, I don't think I've mentioned that before. So I'm out of town, but I'm coming to Christchurch. There are two benefits for Christchurch in hosting the New Zealand Bike Expo. First, CAN and Spokes Canterbury want to support the Council in your significant infrastructure investment in cycleways. We love it. It's just fantastic. So thank you so much for doing it. I went out with Robert yesterday on the um, Papua Nui Parallel, and it was just so exciting. And I'm so jealous, coming from Wellington. I know that Christchurch is leading the way in putting in cycling infrastructure to the country. And um, so basically, the best way that we can support as community um, cyclists, support the council is to organise a bike toba. So Spokes Canterbury is organising Bike Toba, um, which is a series of fun public events throughout the springtime, which is a great time to sort of get people out to get on their bicycle. And Cairns doing um, the Bike Expo which is a consumer show, bringing in the whole retail community and bringing in lots of visitors into Christchurch and getting people in Christchurch out there and having fun and enjoying um, um, the getting on a bike and just having fun. So we, um, that's the best way we think. Turning the culture around, getting people involved is the best thing that we can do to help support your significant investment. Um, council staff are supporting uh, behind us as well, supporting it with their, their marketing efforts around the major cycle routes. And Clary will be having a stand to talk about the major cycle routes at the Expo, which is great. Um, and the second benefit for the council is, and for the region is the economic benefit. The Expo, um, we're, we're talking to suppliers all over the country, and a lot of them will come through the local retailers to get to the event. Local retailers um, and the businesses are in a great position to leverage of this. We want to build it up to be a major thing year after year in Christchurch. Um, hosting an expo, it's a nat natural consequence of broadening the appeal to bicycles, but, and this is where the economic benefit can come in. Um, so why am I here talking to you today? <laughs> Creating something new is about having relationships and building relationships. We're from out of town. My event manager and I are from out of town. Um, so forgive us for, for coming here. Um, the reason why we've decided to, to choose um, Christchurch, besides being the favourite, New Zealand's favourite place to ride, is because Don Babe from Spokes Canterbury said, Joe, you should do that expo idea that you, you've been you know, throwing around you should do it down here in Christchurch because we're doing Bike Toba and it should be part of Bike Toba. And that's why we went, okay, let's go to Christchurch. And the reason why Spokes is creating Bike Toba um, is due to, and I must acknowledge um, Councillor Clearwater here, is due uh, to the council bringing the Asia Pacific Cycle Congress to Christchurch. So the APCC is coming and Spokes said, OK, we'll do Biketober around that. And then they've brought Cannon to say, OK, we're going to do the expo here. And it turns out spring is a fantastic time to do this kind of thing. It gets people on their bike, start of the <laughs> daylight savings out and about. Um, and I think it's the best time of year to do these kind of promotions for bicycles. Um, so the reason why I'm talking to you 
is building something up from scratch. We don't have the stats from last year. You know, retailers are coming in behind us. They're taking a risk too because they can't. We can't point to the stats from last year and say we got so many visitors. Um, they're, they're putting their thing in behind. Success breeds success. The way to build it up is for people. And, and you're all community leaders, and you've got huge community networks. Um, and every day, whether you're a cyclist or not yourself, you're talking to people who do cycle. So please get the word out there. Please talk to people. Please excite them about this event. It, it's, um, it helps protect your investment, and it helps to grow that bicycle economy. Um, you can like us and share. Um, our, our Facebook page is www dot nz bike expo dot nz nice and easy and um, we're on facebook so please um, share that like that and just get the share the love and get it out there thank you thank you very much indeed for that update this morning october certainly is going to be a good time to be here and it's great to um to have heard about the work that you're doing and the collaboration with others as well exciting <laughs> stuff thank you very much indeed for taking the time to come along this morning thank you thank, thank you, you. Aaron. Just, just to follow a question from that, just to you, Mr. Chair, that as a council we should consider referring to all our documents and wording as Bike Tober this year rather than October. <laughs> just we officially name everything, just because we are the biking capital of New Zealand. Great, thank you. Okay, um, our um, second um, participant in, in the public participation this morning is um, David Lynch. David, if you'd like to come to the table, please. Um, and David is going to speak to the council regarding Cathedral Square and surroundings. Um, and as with the um, previous participation, you have five minutes to make your presentation to us. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, for this opportunity. Uh, I must confess that the uh, what you have before you was written a short time ago, as I wasn't quite sure until about. 1 a.m. this morning due to a client issue that I would be here. Um, I'm here today in my own capacity um, as a public relations consultant um, and in my professional opinion as someone that's had reasonable and significant experience in fact a number of consultation and engagement matters as I've set out and I've also mentioned as someone that was uh, pleased to be involved with a group that was successful in overturning the government's decision on Victoria Square that I believe I come with some experience and knowledge to provide some what I hope is constructive observations with respect to what I consider is a, an important way forward for Cathedral Square, but right now being rushed. So as I have set out, I consider that the three weeks set aside for the public engagement through Regenerate uh, for the planned redevelopments of Cathedral Square is totally, totally inadequate. How is a company able to engage an expert, for example, over traffic engineering matters with a meaningful submission and you give them just three weeks? How does a voluntary organisation meet with its members on this important matter and submit on the matter? And how can anyone, in my view, make a meaningful and fully informed submission when the consultation document is woefully inadequate in providing essential background information that I'll refer to a little bit later on. We generate Christchurch interestingly claim under the engagement principles to be respectful and to put people and communities at the centre of what they are about. I respectfully submit that we generate Christchurch on this occasion as being disrespectful when you consider the efforts required to make a submission within the time frame they have set and with the significant limitations of the information that you can base a meaningful submission on. We generate Christchurch is running late, as we know, with their June consultation, and we now have, obviously, a shortened opportunity to be engaged 
but I would argue that this does not suit the very important community that has a huge investment in Cathedral Square and we need to stop and pause. So what have I tried to do in the last few weeks? I had uh, engaged with Regenerate and I asked for the following. A copy of the traffic management analysis supporting the proposed changes to Cathedral Square and its surrounding streets that will be used to service the current and future businesses in the area. An indication of the type of new businesses that regenerate Christchurch and this council expect will establish as a consequence of the proposal as put forward proceeding. A copy of a business case and budget supporting the proposed changes. A list of the property owners and businesses consulted in the preparation of the proposal and a timetable for the final consultation on, on the finished plans and its costings. On Tuesday, August 1, I received an acknowledgement of my communication to Regenerate Christchurch and was advised that my inquiry was being forwarded through to the strategy and regeneration planning team, and they would be in contact with me soon after. I have received no answer from Regenerate to any of the questions that I set out, which I am sure you appreciate isn't helpful for someone that is representing clients that may wish to make submissions, and in my own case, will also, as a resident, do, though, do so. So I make the following formal request that I hope you will consider seriously today, and that is that I believe this council should move accordingly at this meeting to notify Regenerate to extend the time frame of the engagement by six weeks at the minimum and nine weeks preferable. I would also suggest that they need to respond to the request for information made by people in a timely manner, and I suggest they also need to address the inadequacies in the information that is in their consultation documentation. The important issues to this council as I see it. You appoint, as I understand, half the board of Regenerate. So when we look at the costs, is it reasonable to have an open-ended wish list without indicating the costs when you're engaging people. The Margaret Mayhe playground blew up to 40.9 million and reliable building construction industry sources have told me and estimated that the redevelopment of Cathedral Square could cost $60 million or more. Who do we know will bear that cost? The ratepayers? And in that matter of heritage, Christchurch Square and its objects within the square Cathedral Square, have heritage protection under the district plan. The Christchurch City Council be, should be ensuring that Cathedral Square, which is part of, the heritage, of our heritage, should be protected, and yet I can see no reference, no reference whatsoever, in the documentation from Regenerate that makes reference to this very important underlying factor. The Cathedral Square, as someone pointed out to me, appears to be heading in the direction of a fair ground attraction. A business owner observed that Regenerate's plans appear to be turning Cathedral Square into a three-space circus, designed to run as an ongoing carnival to attract, for example, by people by placing ad hoc buildings to hide the convention centre, as I understand. Is this seriously a legitimate approach to looking at our serious heritage in the centre of the square, and I, uh, I would argue not. So today, I would respectfully request that this council regenerate Christchurch, and let's not forget the Crown, should get together and consider whether, in fact, the matters I have raised, and I know other people, are worthy of serious consideration under some urgency. Thank you. And thank you very much for um, participating in our meeting this morning. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. So that brings us to the next item, um, and I would um, ask James Lundy, um, General Manager of Regeneration Planning for Regenerate Christchurch, to come to the table. Um, and James, you're going to give us a short presentation on the um, Cathedral Square and Surrounds piece of work. So welcome to the table. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Kia ora kato. Uh, no, just a, I mean, you, I don't want to introduce you. You know, Carolyn. Uh, this is a joint. This is a joint project between Regenerate and uh, the council, and um, we've been working collectively with uh, the council's planning department um, and other other organisations within the, the, the council. 
the traffic planning people and the engineering um, aspects uh, to investigate the square. Um, how do we get this up? Um, is Chris going to? Yep, come on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and keep this short uh, and, and, and tight uh, because I know that you, you're probably very familiar with um, the, the five key moves. Uh, the, the title is Bringing Life to the Core of Christchurch City. Uh, what we're charged to do is to find, uh, to find a method of delivering the recovery strategy that has been carried out um, by CIRA in the square. So what we're trying to do is to find the, the, the triggers that will advance um, the, the, the investment because if you walk around the square you will see that investment has lagged in that area from the private sector. So the stra strategy and purpose that we are to provide a clear and well supported vision for the area that builds on the vision that was in the recovery plan, identify any planning changes and all statutory policy tools to enable the vision to be implemented, recommend immediate initiatives to bring more people into the city, reinforce a positive international image of the future city. So they're all based on the recovery plan and we're here to, our organisation is there to deliver outcomes from the um, recovery plan. Uh, the area that we're talking about isn't just Cathedral Square. We have gone out with one key issue at the moment, which is uh, recognising that Cathedral Square has always been very important to <coughs> the city. Um, it it's, is iconic for the city and a much overused word, but not in this case. It is an icon of, of the city and it's something that's memorable in internationally. It's a large public space. But the area that we're concerned on is the area, and you'll see the red dotted, um, the red dotted line and the smaller red, red dashed line and the smaller red dots of buildings which are sites that aren't developed yet or have derelict buildings in them. It's the area of the city that has responded least since the earthquake. That's the ra rationale for choosing this area as, as one of our focus projects. It was given to us and it's part of our mandate by government that this is the project we have to focus on along with the red zone. So what we built on, because we didn't start from scratch, we've started from a position that's, that's uh, building on all the work that the council had done before in the square and all the work that CIRA has done before, um, since. So it's been, uh, th this plan in some ways has been six years in the making at least, but probably another 10 years before that too. So share an idea, we had a, 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 we, we had a consultant mine that information, that's a huge amount of information. We pulled out concepts from share an idea and we, 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 we grouped them into various categories. Uh, we did some market research to check if, if um, public opinion has changed since share an idea and we were quite distant from that market research. Uh, we set up a project reference group which has a broad representation of, of the community and also includes councillors. And we engage directly with property and business owners and I have personally spoken to 60 property and business owners within that space um, over the past two months. So we've had quite a broad spectrum. We've also had 70,000 viewers of the Christchurch Dilemmas um, programme. We've had about 600 responses so far to a questionnaire. Um, the project reference group, I'm not going to dwell on them because they've all um, devoted a large amount of their time to helping uh, to be a litmus test and a touchstone. They're not a decision making group, but they're the group that we bounced ideas and concepts off of. And they include sort of diverse groups such as social and youth students and heritage organisations and just people who are really active in the city, but also other organisations like the casino and the airport that are really um, key to um, the growth of the city. Um, the objectives, and we're adding to these as we go through um, the, the consultation, uh, breathing life back into Cathedral Square, streets and lanes, prioritising small business, creative industries and residential. Um, there is a long-standing um, uh, mandate that, um, to achieve at least 20,000 residents within the four <coughs> avenues which would mean trying to achieve about two and a half to 5,000 residents within this area. And so we're investigating how do we get that to happen? 
with the private sector, improving access, experience and perception, strengthening ecological integrity, showcasing bicultural stories, capturing the spirit and the response to the earthquakes because the city has changed and people have changed. How do we respond to that change? Some of it is positive. Um, and it's now how we're defined. We won a, a major award as a city uh, for our street art. So how do we keep that um, going? And then there's another one being added um, recently by um, exposure to community groups, is, is um, that to create an urban neighbourhood because people that live in a place take ownership of it. So bringing community back into that area. Um, Physically, that's the area. As you will see, the square is only a small part of it, but this part of our consultation is focusing on the square, not the rest. Um, so the key moves that we're looking at looks at the wider area. The first key move is reshaping the square to create a more lively and variety of public spaces. Reshaping doesn't mean building it out. It means dropping objects in if they will enliven it um, and changing the nature of the spaces that are around it, which is more difficult because most of the spaces around it at the moment are in private ownership. But we don't want to go back to the lack of active use on the ground floor that we had before the earthquake. We have to find a way of engaging. Good example of that is negotiations with the, um, the owners of the what will be the new Spark building. And, and it wasn't hard negotiations, they volunteered. They've got an arcade on the ground floor of their new office building, which will have 500 staff in it. They'll also have a research and development unit, and they're putting hospitality and retail on the whole ground floor fronting Hereford and the square. So that's the kind of trench warfare that we're engaged in. You know, it will be site by site, block by block, owner by owner. So this is one touchstone that we're doing of gauging people's opinion and appetite for change. Key move number two is forming the square with structures and buildings um, to stimulate arts, creative enterprises, knowledge and education. This is purely a concept. If the community reacts extremely negative to it, then it is a concept that will be revisited and redeveloped. But like many spaces, there are always objects that appear. These objects wouldn't be ordinary buildings. There's no point. We have lots of vacant land in the city. This would only be if an emerging use came that was going to add to the international profile of the city. Think of it as your Pompidou Centre. If that occurred, where would it be located? But we're actually talking about things that might only be where we put temporary structures. If you want events, you don't want temporary structures in the centre of a space. You want them on the edge. So one of the things that key things that came out from the people who organize events was having an event ready space that when events happen there is a space that they can immediately move into and be used the square has to be used by all sorts of people it's everybody's place it's one part in the city where it should be totally inclusive rich poor young old eth ethnic diversity there are very few other places in cities other than the center where everybody needs to be felt welcomed. Um, the, the next key move, because I'm going to go through the, the photos quite quickly, so concentrate on the key moves. Um, so improving connectivity to, through and around the area. Um, the area started out life as a park, um, Rid Rid Ridley Square, uh, then the, the cathedral developed, then Colombo Street was put through. Uh, it's, it's gone through a number of changes through times, but for most of its life it was a transit hub. It was where the trams came in, it's where the buses came in, and along with them came active uses like cinemas, restaurants, cafes, bars, um, and then eventually hotels and various other things. So that was the purpose of it. Um, changing nature of traffic and transport and the changing nature of development left us in the year 2000 with a problem in the square that it wasn't really had a, a use. So there was, an, there was an attempt to create a new purpose and a new use in 2000 for the square. We're revisiting that, given everything that's happened, and seeing where do we take it now? What's its purpose? I think its main purpose in the research we've done is it is still a hub. It has to be a hub. It's the center of town. It's where everything um, connects and distributes. So the green lines show a network of lanes that largely exist or are being built at the moment 
and we're proposing new lanes so that basically you can walk seamlessly through from all the shops in Cashel through a network of lanes and then up on the, the Avon River Corridor and, and continue on. So we're trying to stitch the whole place together, Avon River Corridor, East Frame Park, a network of, of lanes, and then the, 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 the purple or pink um, lines show the connections to the wider area that we have to work on. That might be cycling, walking, or it could be public transport. So we're investigating all these things. We're only part way through that because this is testing the appetite for people for this, including the council's appetite for this kind of, of approach. Um, so the, the key move five is the reintroduction of water. We haven't had water in that area, uh, well actually since the earthquake, but we haven't had water in that area since it was developed. So now what we're looking at is water, but we're talking about water as a story and a metaphor. Water that deals ecologically with storm, uh, systems that deal ecologically with stormwater, reintroduction of natural vegetation, the reintroduction of natural bird life through that, because we've got the Avon River corridor, which will be going into the red zone in large areas of, of, of wetland and bush. So extending that idea of wetland and, and natural vegetation to complement the, the mixed vegetation along the Avon River corridor, and also the mixed vegetation that exists already in the, in the square. Um, wider initiatives that we're looking at is the kind of businesses that would lo locate here, um, how do we get residential to work, we're having a lot of success with hoteliers, the hoteliers are waiting for a key number of factors to happen, key number of factors that the hoteliers are telling us they, is they, they're waiting to the convention centre um, contracts announced, um, which is very soon. Uh, they would like to see some movement on the cathedral. They're all things that we all know. And they would like to see the public realm improved because most people that think it's okay haven't been there. Um, I walk through it every day. I've got a team in there at the moment looking at it as, as a design team. It's quite broken, the public realm. R regardless of what happens, it needs to be lifted and replaced. It's just one of these things that you have in cities. It's ongoing maintenance of public areas. Um, we're also looking at existing, committed, uh, existing and committed off-street car parking and the potential for more off-street car parking. So we're investigating that. How do, we, how do you deliver it? Who delivers it? Where, where should it be? And how do we future-proof the buildings for the time when maybe we don't need so many car park spaces, when we've got a more compact, um, more dense city with better public transport? But we're in a transitional period where people do use cars. So there. Now, other things that are happening, the library is opening in about a year's time, town halls opening in a year's time, convention centre opening in three years' time, there's hotels already opening there, Spark Building opening in about a year's time. Um, we will see a very much transformed place in three years' time. This will be a transformed city centre. And, and, and the, the Jewel in the Crown, uh, from my point of view, the Performing Arts Centre, th this will have more theatres within one strip than anywhere outside major European cities or American cities. Nowhere else in Australia is there will have seven performance spaces within one urban block. And that is a unique selling point for this. Basically, you're getting London's West End dropped into the centre of Christchurch. Um, so reshaping the square, giving different purposes. These are just ideas. Nobody in the right mind would design places that were pink, green, and yellow and purple. They are actually to illustrate uses and areas. Obviously, all these areas have to integrate. You don't, you, you know, we used to put different carpet in every room. I can still remember growing up in houses where every room had a different ha heavily patterned carpet. We ripped them all out and we put a plain carpet in to unify and then we dress and decorate it with objects and artwork and, and possessions. And urban spaces are, are no different. This is what we're looking at now to bring us back to a sense of reality. Um, so we, we're looking here at the mouth. This is how it looks. There's the road that goes round the side. There's the balance of the land for the convention site, centre site. And um, we can see uh, the Millennium Hotel, which is going to open in about a year's time as a distinction hotel. And we've got the Rendezvous Hotel. Um, and we've got the Novotel there. We've got the, the, um, the Spark Building will be built in that area. And the Town Hall will be restored. So it could look something more like that, but it might look very different. But we have to reach that level 
of standard to be an international player or even a national player again. Again, we've missed out on the tourism boom. It's still going. We can capture that again. But more than that, we need to welcome our own citizens back into the centre. Um, and it's happening. Spend is up. City centre is outperforming um, the other key activity centres now. And that's a good point. Um, and of course, we need a nighttime environment. One of the things that is quite distinct between a neighbourhood area like Rickerton, key activity centre, and a city centre is a nighttime economy. And we need a nighttime economy in any city. If you want to keep your young and you want to keep your old, they have to have a nighttime economy. Um, and, and if you want to keep the best and the brightest, you have to create a vibrant city for them. Because there's a lot of competition out there. Um, my, my oldest daughter's gone to Sydney. I'd like to see her come back here. Um, so how, how the area currently looks, the library, which, uh, and this shot's really out of date now, it's coming on phenomenally, the library now, um, <coughs> and how the library will look in a, in a particular dedicated space. We've alluded here, because we haven't actually come up with, there is a, 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 a traffic um, concept for this area. It is done under the Accessible Cities programme. We're still following that programme. That's still in place. But that anticipated an extended rapid transit and public transport system. So we're looking at how would that look? Where would you put it? Um, then we look at how the current area looks at the moment. This is the area. Remember what I said? Spark building built in a year's time, potentially a year, year and a half. Um, we've got the Distinction Hotel opening in a year's time. This is their, their view at the moment. This could be their view, because the, in that other research, people said they wanted a green space, they wanted more vegetation, they wanted <coughs> water. So this is me, this, these are merely illustrations that are showing what some people have asked for. We will then distill through this engagement a design that actually ties it all together. So. Um, Framing it, would we put buildings in that space? They're not to hide the convention centre. The convention centre is part of the square. It hasn't got an active edge to the square, but it has got a site where they're proposing a hotel, and that's illustrated there. Um, so what we're saying is there could be temporary, there could be um, transitional architecture, there could be anything there. But if the circus came to town again, um, uh, which it used to locate in the square. There are lots of photos of when the circus went into the square. If the circus came to town again, we might not put them in the middle, we would put them on the edge. We ha best spaces in the world have active edges. People cling to the edges, they don't walk through the middle. The middle is where you have performances and activities. Um, parking, I'm not going to go through that, you're well aware, you're probably more aware of parking than I am, but the, the, the deeper purple shows two minute walk from a car park. So coverage in that area, the, 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 the blue circles are a maximum four minute walk from car park buildings. You will notice that we've put in the, the Performing Arts Centre car park. Because it's not built yet, we haven't put a deep blue, which turns out purple when you put it on top of blue. You haven't put a, we haven't put a deep blue circle around it. And then there's the other one, which is in the old Ridges Hotel, and they're going to rebuild their car park building. That will cover that area. So the area will be covered with off-street car parking, um, quite generous amount um, of off-street car parking. There is another issue that emerges. I may as well say it because it's quite it's coming out of all the discussions. I talked to CBBA last night, went to their meeting talk. The issue really is free car parking for a, a length of time. It's not the number of car parks. It, it's, it's a perception of paying for car parks. Uh, and that's a different debate to have. That's a debate for them to have with council and private car park owners and, and retailers. So the other one is upgrading the streets and lanes between the activity hubs. One of the things that we've indicated is um, that, that New Regent Street has struggled on and off over the years. If it actually becomes a continuous lane that stretches right down from the retail district right across the river is the opportunity of being really well connected to a network of lanes that turns it into a main street for a residential population. 
so we secure the future of these lanes by the activities around them. Um, integrating water and indigenous ecosystems into streets and public spaces, not had much kickback about that idea, most people like it, most people like green, most people want, want spaces to relax. Wider initiatives, uh, we're going to look at, um, get to understand the land use requirements and regulatory and policy changes that might be needed, what investment and incentives might be required, how spaces can be activated in the short and the medium term, because we might not see full build out for, one, for, for some length of time, but we can't live with it in the conditions that in at the moment. So we're looking at activation strategies and how the strategy could be implemented with actions, time frames, priorities, and the sort of level of financing and investment needed and what sort of return the city would get from that investment. So I'm sorry, I rapidly went through it as quickly as I could. Um, happy to take questions. Yeah, we actually don't have time for any questions, unfortunately. Um, but thank you very much indeed for you know what's been a, a very visual presentation. Certainly been good. I know a number of us have seen a, a similar presentation or maybe the same presentation at, um, at other events. Um, but certainly it's been good for that to be presented in um, a very public environment today and in front of um, thank all you of the councillors that are here. Thank you very much indeed for taking the thank time you, to do so. Thank, thank you. you. Now, I'm aware that there are people here this morning who um, are on time constraints. Um, we do have a deputation by appointment from Michael Bell. Is, is Michael here? Um, what I propose to do, if we can, Michael, um, is to take item 10, which is the Limwood Central Heathcote Community Board report to Council first, um, which should be a relatively short item, and then move to your deputation, if that's all right. Um, the, the chair of that board has got an appointment that she needs to get to, so I'm